everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So let's get started. So remember last day we were talking about trees, in particular I was talking about tree traversals. I introduced you to the idea of a post-order traversal. Remember in a post-order traversal what happens is I visit all my descendants before I consider myself, right? This is in contrast to a pre-order traversal where what I do is I visit myself and then I check all my descendants. So that's generally the idea here. So pre means visit before, post means I'm going to visit myself last, okay? So I showed you this idea of, of computing the total space used by a file system, which is organized like a tree. So recall that last day we would shown that the worst case running time is linear in the number of nodes in the tree. And I said I was going to talk about the space complexity. So let me start right there. Let's use green. Let's not use green. So I'm going to assume that the tree is already constructed because obviously I need to compute the space of the tree. So I'm going to assume that's already constructed. So I want you to remember that each recursive, uh, each recursive call introduces an activation record to the call stack. So very important. So what should we know about each one of these calls? Well, I use a constant amount of variable space, right? So I have S and that's it, and then I maybe get this, and that's it. So we know that each one of the calls will take a cost amount of space. Each call uses a constant amount of space. Uh, we'll call this C, constant C, amount of space. So the space complexity depends on the size of the call stack, right? But I want you to think about this. Well, how do I determine the height of the call stack here? What, what exactly is, is going to be the height of the call stack? Well, I want you to imagine that I consider each one of my children before I, uh, myself, right? Each one of these calls is going to call on its children. And each one of them is going to call on their children. And so on, and so on, and so on. So, what exactly does this look like then? So, you got to well, what you got to imagine this is that each time I call one of my children, now potentially that child might actually be on this path down to the deepest node in the tree, which happens to have maximum depth. So, you can imagine I can keep going down all the way down until I get to a leaf. So what exactly is the height of the call stack then? Notice that the deepest node the deepest node in the file system tree determines the height, I will say size, instead of height, we'll call 
both sides. Because we've already talked about enough things involving heights. Let's talk about, let's say the size. The size of the call stack. This is, is the height of the tree. Right? So note that, remember, I remember the tree is already constructed, so I'm not really counting that in here. I'm just counting at the auxiliary space, really. So, how exactly is this going to look? Thus, the sides of the stack. is one for the original call plus plus the height h of the tree. So I'm going to call it h. You'll find out very often we'll like to use h. h of the tree and the space complexity Is okay for each one of them is some constant c amount of space, so I'm just going to say c times h plus one, which is what in terms of big O? What is it? Well, you can see quite clearly that it relates to h, right? Which is big O of h. So I want you to think about this. Well, how bad can that look? Well, well, what can the tree look like? What can my file system tree look like? Now imagine, imagine you're just look, thinking about having all your files, and you may think about each one of the possible children having potentially a directory that's directly so-called below it in the tree. So eventually I get down to some file possibly. Well, the point is, is that you can see that the height of this tree actually can grow quite dramatically. In fact, it's in terms of the number of nodes in the file system tree. I wouldn't recommend organizing the file system like this. I would recommend if you can, try to keep it what I'll call bushy, as opposed to this giant chain. So in the worst case scenario, the tree is degenerate, and particularly when I say degenerate, I mean a chain, like I have over on the left over there. Thus. Thus, the worst case space complexity is what? What is it? What is it? Okay, now it depends on the chain. How many nodes are in that chain? It's n, right? There's, there's all of the nodes are along that chain. So, worst case space complexity is linear. So you can see that this could get really bad very quickly in terms of the amount of memory you're going to be using for this. So naturally, you would try to find ways of getting rid of this need to use the call stack. So you would try to write this iteratively so you aren't going to make all these recursive calls. Okay, so you see what I mean? So this is just showing you an application of post-order traversal. Okay. So that's, I think that's a little bit enough for talking about just specifically generalized trees. What we're going to do is we're going to switch topics. But you're going to find we're going to be still very much talking about trees. So anyways, we're going to be talking about priority queues. So you might know what a priority queue is. Uh, it's a generalization of a queue. So a queue, of course, being a, a you can think of it like a line where People can enter and leave the queue, 
or NQ and DQ out of the queue. For each one of those, we'll have one after the other enter and we'll leave. So we talked about a queue, I think when we were talking about stacks earlier on in this course. So this is a generalization where each one of the elements that I put into the queue has a priority. So when I perform DQs or remove operations on this priority queue, what will happen is it will only take out the element that has the highest priority. For us in this discussion, the priority is going to be as small as possible. So the ones with the smallest priority are those that we're going to remove first. And if there's ever a time, you just kind of just pick one. Okay? So each one of the elements is going to consist of a key or priority. So I'll refer to the priority as a key, and then you may have some value or data that's associated with it. So each one of the, now one very important detail I need to point out is that I need to be able to compare the, any two elements that are going to go into my priority queue so that I can kind of list them out for you. So this is why it's so called comparable. So I'm able to take any element, I'm be, I should be able to tell you if it comes before, after, or is the same element in terms of how I'm ordering them. So I should be able to list them from smallest to largest, or largest to smallest, if you'd like. Okay, so let's talk about the ADT. So this is what's describing the priority queue. And what is it going to support? So these are going to be the main ones we're going to look at. Is The first one is inserts, where what we do is I give you some key and some value. And what I do is I create an element, and then I put it into the priority queue. So I'm going to abbreviate priority queue with PQ very often, because writing a priority queue every single time gets a little monotonous. I don't want to waste your time. So beyond that, we have these other operations here. So first, we have min. What it does is it returns you the element with minimal key, meaning whenever I wanted to know, if I want to know the person that's sitting at the highest priority, and I want to be able to know at least that person, or that object, or whatever it might be, it's the one with minimal key or highest priority. And if it's null, sorry, if the priority queue is empty, then you were going to return null. So I must stress that this does not actually remove the element from the priority queue. That's what remove min is going to be. Remove min is just going to remove and return that element. And of course, null if the priority queue is empty. And then we're going to consider the size. So this would just be the number of elements in the priority queue. I must stress it's the number of elements, not if we have an overall underlying structure, it's not the number of number of places you could put an element, it is the number of elements. Likewise, if it's empty, this is the same as we've had all these other ones. So it returns true if there are no elements, false otherwise. I think I hear the crickets. <laughs> I apologize for that. So one thing I do want to stress, because some students will think, okay, well, you've been talking about dictionaries up to this point. This is not a dictionary, it is a priority queue. So elements are allowed to have duplicate keys here. So it must be stressed that this is not a dictionary. This is a priority queue. Okay, so where are we gonna go from here? So we talked about what the ADT looks like. So I'm going to talk about some ways you can actually implement the priority queue. Now, a one natural way you can do this is with a doubly linked list. But I'll uh, so you so uh, so let's consider a simple implementation. Doubly linked list. So I'm just going to write down each one of these methods. 
So we have insert. Now I'm going to consider two different kinds of doubly linked lists. I'm going to first consider an unsorted one and then a sorted one. Now, I must stress that remember I'm thinking about the best way I could possibly do this with an unsorted doubly linked list and then a sorted doubly linked list. So this is the one where I put in elements, but the thing is, I don't keep them sorted as I'm doing so. This one I do. So for insert, if it's unsorted, I can just put it maybe at the tail end of the linked list. I, I'd be fine like doing that, or maybe at the beginning. It doesn't matter a whole lot, I can do it in constant time. However, in a sorted double linked list, I would have to take linear time in the worst case. Do you ever see that? It's because I have to go through one after that. I have to go through all of those elements in the worst case, which would require me, of course, to mostly check them all and then put it in. How about min? Computing the minimum. Well, if it's unsorted, I have to check them all possibly in the worst case. However, if it's sorted, where should it be located? Either at the front or at the back of the doubly linked list, right? How about remove min? Well, this isn't a whole lot different. It's just the same complexity there. It's a big O of n and big O of 1. Same justification. The only difference is I'm removing the actual node from my doubly linked list. Okay, for size, straightforward. I just keep track of that as I'm doing things. Is empty. How about is empty? Is empty. Well, this isn't that hard. If I, if I compute the size, I should be able to compute is empty very quickly. I'll let you think about that. So we're going to move away from talking about bees, and we're going to talk more about trees. So this is going to be one of the first manifestations of where trees are very powerful as a concept in data structures. So you're going to find that we're going to talk a lot about trees in this class. So I'm going to talk about what is called a heap. Let's talk about heaps. We will consider, we will consider binary trees. Which are special, special kinds of trees. So you may know what a binary tree is, but I'm going to define it here. So this is going to be an ordered tree. Now what we're going to do is we're going to label these two children as the left and the right child. Where each child node is labeled as either a left child or a right child. Where a left child precedes, precedes means it comes before a right child. So that's the order property of this tree. So that is a binary tree. So you might know of these, but I just want to lay out the definition. We're going to see what one of these might look like in a little bit. Now, we're going to be considering a special kind special kind of binary tree that's going to allow us to make 
some nice key observations when we want to try to implement a priority queue. So that's kind of our end goal is to come up with all of the methods for a priority queue using trees. In particular, we're going to be looking for a special kind of tree, a special kind of binary tree, that has two properties. So it's a so-called heap order property. This is property number one. For each node or position, remember I said that I might talk about them as positions. For each node in position P other than the root, other than the root, the key of P is greater than or equal to the key of its parent. So if I give you some node or position in the tree, it must be that if I look at its key, it must be greater than or equal to its parent. Another way you can also look at this, so I give you a node, then all of its children's keys must be at least as big as mine. So they can be bigger as, as long as my, my, my node's key isn't violating this property. So you can either look at it from the perspective of a node, talk about its parent, or you can talk about all the children with respect to the node. So that's the first property. So this is property number one. Property number two is going to be called the complete binary tree property. So the complete binary tree property. So this is a binary, a binary tree. Uh, that is where, where all its levels, and we're going to talk about which ones, 0, 1, 2, all the way up to h minus 1, where h is the height, have 2 to the i nodes. Note that 2 to the i is the maximum possible number of nodes you could have in a binary tree at a given level. So do keep that in mind. That's, it's not a magic number or anything. This is the maximum possible number of nodes I can have at a given level of a binary tree. So just draw with the binary tree as I mentioned here. Just maybe add, make it so every, every, uh, every node has two children. You can see that this is quite obvious. And the remaining nodes and the remaining nodes at level H at H are in the leftmost possible position. I'll talk more about what that means in a moment, but the way you need to look at this property is that every one of the levels of the binary tree, except for the last one, must be as many as possible. So the last level might have one node in it, or it might have all of the possible places where a node could be at level H, where that can happen. Uh, there'll be as it might be that it's completely full, so you can either have one or it could possibly have full. So the whole point is that there's going to be this property where they're going to be shuffled over to the left as much as possible. I'll show you a picture in a moment. So if it satisfies one and two, so one and two, so if you have one and two, this is called a binary heap. 
which I'll abbreviate as just a heap in this lecture, and maybe in the next class too. So if you have one and two together, this is a binary heap. So the idea is that we're going to have this heap order property to maintain the property that our keys are going to be in a nice relative way that such that we can permute them very easily without with very easy predictable behavior. This is going to ensure that the sh this property number two is for maintaining the shape of the binary heap. So we're going to have both of these in play. Let me draw you out one. Five, six. So this is still the root of the binary tree. This is the left child of five. So I'm just writing down the keys, by the way, because they're the only part that's really relevant for our algorithms here. However, you need to be stressed that remember, these are whole elements oftentimes. So in very simple implementations, the key will just be the number that you're actually operating on. So for example, if you have an array, you might have it where you put them into the heap, but the keys are the only things that matter. However, remember, keep in mind that this can be quite general. So this is the left child, that's the right child. I'm just going to draw them like this, so it's very easy to spot what the left and the right should be. 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, So the big thing I want you to observe as I'm doing this is that if I look at any one of these, these nodes, that its parent will have a key that is going to end up being uh, going to be going to be either the same value as it or smaller. So if I look at if I look at however at any one node, its children must be either the same value as it or it's greater. So remember, this is level zero, that's level one, this is level two, and that's level three. So notice that this one has two to the zero, two to the one, two squared, and this might have potentially up to eight nodes in this level. So this satisfies the heap order property if you look at the keys, and it has the right shape. It has this complete binary tree property. So notice that all of these will all have the maximum possible nodes possible, but the last one's allowed to be a little different. Okay, so the big thing I want you to observe is that you, if you actually read this thing, um, I want you to keep in mind the following. Where is the minimum val the minimum key? Where is it? Where is it? It's right there. Notice that the minimum is right here. So the root. So the root has a minimum key. So keep in mind that this isn't the only case where the minimum might occur. It might occur in its children. However, it is the same value. It is the minimum. So it's the smallest possible value is going to be sitting in the root. So it's worth noting that this structure, as I've written it, is called a mini heap. This is called a min heap or minimum heap. It's because of the way I've ordered the keys. In contrast, a max heap would be where the largest value would be in the root, and I would invert everything I just said over there for the heap order property. So instead, it would be less than or equal to. So, so every one of its children must either be its same value or it must be smaller in a max heap. So, so a max heap, in contrast, would be where you have it where where the largest and instead of thinking about its uh, the keys of children must be less than or equal to the key of the node in question. So it's just that it's just everything except I've just inverted what the inequalities relationship would be. It's really not that much different. 
We're going to talk about min heaps when we talk about heaps here, with one exception towards the end. So it's really not that bad. But the big thing I want you to observe is that you can actually read off this heap. If you look at it a little bit carefully, you can look at it by its levels. And the, this is where the shape is going to really matter. So when I read this off, I can read it off by levels here. Now, do note that it does not mean it's going to be from smallest to the biggest when I read them off by level, but this is going to be very important. I can read it as 5, 6, 8, 7, 10, 12, 11, and all the rest from left to right. So, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a neat property about these heaps. So we're going to prove a, an interesting property that involves heaps. Now, just before I get to that, just to stress a couple of small things, how many records does that heap have over here? How many does it have? Sorry, not records, elements. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. It has 13 elements in it, right? So if, if you get size, it should return back 13. This is regardless of what the structure that we're implementing it should look like, okay? So we're going to prove a property that's really useful for taco heaps. So this is going to be the, the property we're going to prove. The height, the height h, I have to insert h in there again. Height h of a heap t with n records, with n records, uh, we'll, say, we'll say elements, n elements, is h is equal to the floor of log base 2 of n. So remember, the floor means round down. So if I have a number in here, just round it down to the nearest data term. So this is going to be very helpful for us. So I should point out that t is complete, because it satisfies that property, the second property. So what we're going to observe is just the one I pointed out. Remember, it has appropriate shape for us. How many nodes are in each one of the first these first h minus 1 levels. So there's 1, 2, 4, but this could be a little different. So let's uh, let's observe, use the fact that it's complete to say the following. So the number of nodes in levels levels 0 to h minus 1 R, R2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 squared plus all the way up to 2 to the h minus 1. Now, I'll let you check this because remember this is just, you can, you can actually get a nice, you can invoke the formula that we've used before, the geometric series one, and you can show that this is 2 to the h minus 1. This is a nice one to remember. Then, on level H, what does level H look like? Well, it's possible that there's just one node here. This might be completely full, right? So it could be somewhere in between there. Then on level H, there is at least one node. And at most, how many? How many can there be at most? At level H. Oh, well, remember it's 2 to the i for the level, but what's this? This is this is level H, right? So 2 to the H. So what does that mean? So it follows. So I'm just going to so it follows that that n is greater than or equal to 2 to the h minus 1 plus 1 
sorry, it's 2 to the h minus 2 to the h minus 1. Yeah, 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 that's right. Remember, here, here it is. We don't want it, we don't want to get a little lost here. So remember, this is the sum of all of the nodes we have up to here so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bound the number of nodes here properly. So I have 2 to the h minus 1. Where did that come from? It came from right here. So that it can be at least 1, right? Which this is equal then to 2 to the h. And so I'm just going to, by the way, I'm just going to put a little star beside that line. I'm going to use that. And then I also know that and is, is no more than 2 to the h minus 1 plus what? The maximum number of nodes that I can have at level h, which is 2 to the h, which this is just 2 times 2 to the h minus 1. So all I'm doing is I'm just, notice that I have 2, two to the h in, so I'm just putting 2 times 2 to the h minus 1. I'm just rearranging this a little bit and factoring, which this is equal to what? What is that equal to? What is that equal to? That's equal to 2 to the, that's 2 to the h plus 1, right? Because it's just another multiple of 2. So I've got 2 to the h plus 1 minus 1, which if I rearrange this inequality a little bit, you'll see that I have that minus 1 kicking around, so I just going to move that over to the left-hand side where n is. So I have n plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 to the h plus 1. One. So this I'm going to double star, so I can use it. So that's what we have so far. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to then finish up the proof here. So I have these two right here. I'm going to come back to this picture in a moment. And I'm going to finish up the proof here. This is an important proof. Because I already see the idea. So all I'm doing is I'm just invoking the the property that the tree is complete, or at least depending on what your definition of complete is, it's nearly complete. Um, I have these two inequalities now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take logarithms of both sides of star, so I'm going to take star, then what does that mean? So if I take the log, if I take a logarithm to this one over here, what happens? So I'd have log base 2, so I'm going to take log base 2, log base 2 of n is what it, actually, well, let's think about this. So I put the logarithm here, what happens over, over on this side though? Well, I have a log base 2 of 2 to the h, which you can, by the power rule of logarithms, you can drop the, the h down in front of the logarithm, and you end up with this. You end up with log base 2 of n is going to be greater than or equal to h. So I have that to work with. Then, considering double star, so I'm just going to use double star here. And taking, I'm going to do logarithms to both sides again. To both sides. So, I have this right here. I'm going to take the logarithms to both sides. So what does that mean? Now just to illustrate this, what I did before here, I'm just going to write it out. Log base 2 of n plus 1 all together is less than or equal to log base 2 of 2 to the h plus 1. Which, this if I rewrite it, if I apply the power rule of logarithms, I end up with that that log base 2 of n plus 1 
is less than or equal to h plus 1 times log base 2 of 2. Now, what's log base 2 of 2? Well, ask yourself, okay, well, what's, what can I take to the power of 2 to get, get 2, which is just 1, right? So that's just 1, which, of course, is just going to be simply, is simply log base 2 of n plus 1 minus 1. is going to be, now do you see what I'm doing here? So what I'm doing is I end up with this being one, so I'm just gonna move that plus one here over to the left-hand side, so it's just minus one, is less than or equal to h. So now I have something involving h with both of these. So now all I've gotta do is I just gotta put it together. This really isn't too bad. No, oh, just gotta find my, ah, here we go. Now, I want you to observe, can the height of a heap be a fractional number? No, it must be an integer. So, height h is integral. So, when I say integral, I mean integer value. Therefore, therefore, now I'm just going to put everything together, therefore, I'm going to have it now. I have a lower and an upper bound on the height of e. log base 2 of n plus 1 minus 1 is less than or equal to h. That's right here, right? But what do I also have involving h? This is kind of over here, right? So this is less than or equal to log base 2 of n. But what's that? Well, I want you to look at this carefully. And think about n. Okay, so if I have n being one bigger than over on the right, the furthest right of my inequality chain here, you'll notice very quickly that if I put in something like, and there goes my marker, I'm getting excited here, as you can tell. If I put in something like 7 into this, then this would be log, log base 2 of 8, which would be 3, then minus 1, that's 2. However, you'll notice that this will be something that is going to end up being not quite 3, right? So it's something a little bit less than 3. So you know that this is going to be something that looks kind of like, not, it's not quite 3, right? It's 2. So what should this look like if I were to do that? And likewise, you can make a similar observation if you put a 9 into this or 8. Actually, if you put in 8, this will end up being where you have it as log base 2 of 9, which is something slightly bigger than 3, minus 1, so it's slightly bigger than 2, and then this would be 3 here. You'll see that it's, it's going to end up being where this is going to be, and I'll let you think about this, is that h is going, this is going to imply that, that h is equal to the floor of log base 2 of n. So the reason why is because you'll notice that this n is 1 higher then in the furthest right of my inequality over there. Does everybody see that? And this finishes off my proof. So the big thing I want you to observe is that if we can maintain the pro these two properties for our binary trees, um, so if we can maintain if we can maintain properties 1 and 2, so the heap order property and this property involving the completeness of the tree, 1 and 2, then we can guarantee H is big O of log N. That's the big takeaway here for this proof, is that as long as you maintain the properties of a heap, the height will be big old log n. So we're going to use this property to, to really come up with some very nice and efficient algorithms for some things we're doing with our priority queue. So I already see that. So the big goal here is that as long as we can maintain these two properties whenever we do our operations, 
we're good. We're good. So you're going to find very often in data structures that very often what our goal is going to be is to try to maintain some structure in our data structure so that it always allows us to guarantee certain properties of the data structure. Does everybody see that? So that's going to be a recurring theme this point forward and a lot of the time when we study data structures here. So where are we going to go from here? We're going to talk about an array-based implementation. So let me, let me just move this over. I'm going to need this picture again. So we're going to talk about an array-based implementation. So this is a classic. It's fairly effective. <laughs> See, the one great thing about heaps, this particular binary heap one I'm going to show you is very simple to implement, which is one key nice thing about it. There's a lot of other data structures that have the properties of a heap. But the thing, like in terms of the operations they can do, but you'll find very quickly that it's like, yeah, this is actually really nice and simple. Okay. So I'm just going to make an important remark, and I'll revisit this. For many problems, uh, we will know know the size of the heap. And thus the size of the array. So very often in applications where you're going to use this implementation, you would know how many elements are already in the priority queue, like the maximum number you're going to have. So we're going to just assume this is known. So assume that this is known in advance. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use a very neat implementation of a binary tree. You can use this for binary trees in general, but you'll find for the structure that we're using this for, it's quite natural. So let me, let me, uh, let me write down something about this. We will have an array A, array A of length at least n where we can compute, we can compute the position of some node P using a function f, using f as follows. So very often the f will end up, like this will look a lot more complicated than it actually does in the algorithms themselves. Um, so I want you to observe some of the properties that we're going to have. So if p is the root, then f of p is going to be equal to zero. So in my implementation, the way you want to imagine this is I have an array. So this is A, it's going to have positions 0, 1, 2, 3. How many positions, by the way, am I going to need here? 13, right? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I'll give you two more here, 11 and 12. Okay, so I have my array A here. So where would the root be if I this definition? Five is gonna be sitting in position zero here. So if P is the left child of some position, some position q, then f of p is going to be equal to 2 times f of q plus 1. So if ever I give you some position of a node, so here's 5 here, 
Five is in the root, it's in position zero. Where should its left child be located? So we already know that this one's zero, right? So it would be two times zero plus one, which is one, right? So you know six is gonna go right here. So quite similarly, you're gonna see if P is the right child, the right child of some position Q, then this is the neat and lovely property that we're going to be having here. And F of P is equal to F two times F of Q plus two. So what would be the right child? Where would be the right child? This one. Uh, eight, where should it go? Well, I already know the root is zero. So it would be two times zero plus two, which is going to be eight. So with this, all of these in play, you can actually write out all of them. I'm just gonna remark that the parent, so if P is not the root, is not the root, then the parent of P, the parent of P is in, where is it? I'm just gonna write this up here. It's in the floor of F of P minus one all over two. So the floor of F of P minus one over two. So you'll notice very quickly if I, for example, put in position two, so two, Minus one is one, so one half rounded down is zero, right? So that's how I can get, figure out what the parent is. So this holds throughout the rest of this tree. I'm gonna write out what the rest of this array looks like, and I'll let you think about this. So I encourage you, if you wanna do this on your own, you can always write it out too, but I'll just write them down here, and this will, then we'll stop right here, okay? 11, 14. 22, 18, 17, 15, and then 13. So notice that if ever I want the parent of 13, what I'll do is I'll take 12 minus 1, so 11 divided by 2. Okay, well, what's 11 divided by 2? Well, something slightly less than, than 6, right? So, so it's going to end up being that it's going to be 5, right? So we just 12 right there. Okay, so you can do this for the entire tree. So is that neat? So you have a very simple way of representing a binary tree using an array. So you can use this for various different tree-like structures, but for heaps, it's, we're gonna find it's especially powerful. Okay, so when we come back, we'll talk about how we're going to actually go about each one of our operations using this implementation. So thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.